So this is the overview of laparoscopic hysterectomy. So our terminology and indications total, taking out the entire uterus, uterus including the cervix, supracervical, leaving uh, the cervix, or at least part of the cervix, and then radical, while we're first taking out the uterus, as well as the tubes and ovaries, although usually that's referred to as hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy to avoid um, confusion. So TLH, total laparoscopic, VA, um, LAVH, so that's laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy, and then laparo in general refers to the abdomen or abdominal wall, so we're doing laparoscopy, we're putting our scopes in. You can also do an ectomy, you can remove, so that's laparectomy. You can do an otomy and ins make an incision, so laparotomy, that's for example an abdominal hysterectomy, you incise the abdomen, making a la laparotomy, or you can do a mini lap, so that's just making a small, a smaller than normal um, incision in the abdomen. And then you could also repair, so those are the end, the end words there. So for indications, I'll see if you can get some of the uh, things you could do besides hysterectomy uh, to deal with these problems. So let's say uterine, somebody has uterine lyomyoma, what else could you do? You could try um, myomectomy. You could also try uterine artery embolization for pelvic organ prolapse. You can try to use a pessary for pelvic pain or infection. Let's say the, the pain is caused by endometriosis. What could you try for that? You could try a GnRH analog. You have some abnormal bleeding. You could try ablation. You could ablate the endometrial lining. In malignancy, you could do something like coinization instead of hysterectomy. So the advantages and contraindications for doing it this way, for doing it laparoscopically, in general, the things that, the reasons people like laparoscopic procedures are less pain, less infection, and quicker recovery. So some of the specifics uh, for this is endo to look for endometriosis. You can really look around in the in the abdominal cavity very well. You, you can uh, you get to avoid the injury from creating the incision in the first place. Remember, the genital femoral nerve can be injured with the with the retractors trying to hold open the laparotomy causing anesthesia to the medial, medial thigh and lateral labia. And so all in all, laparoscopic procedures are um, high, highly recommended and common and it's for, for benign disease and some early malignancies. So for contraindications, there's not big time absolute ones. Um, you, mechanical contraindications would be a really big uterus. You're not sure how you're going to get it out through the ports or able to deliver it vaginally. Also severe adhesions and uh, things related to the pneumoperitoneum, for example, if you crank the pressure way up in the in the abdominal cavity, and and then you have a VP shunt draining into there, uh, the shunt will stop working. So that's um, a reason why you might not want to might not want to do this. And then the most common is skill, la lack of knowledge or experience doing the procedure this way. So for the anatomy review, let's see here. We got the peritoneum draped over the uterus, reflecting up onto the bladder anteriorly, making the vesico uterine fold. So we have that. This is the anterior cul-de-sac here. Posterior cul-de-sac or pouch of Douglas back here. Posterior rectum. So the bimanual exam, you might get asked to do this before the procedure. I'll just make it, the angles there. So we got the vaginal opening, cervix, and uterus. And that's the same thing here. Vaginal opening, cervix, uterus. So version. Th these are the things that you report out after you do um, a bimanual exam about where the uterus is. So version. Your push up here. Um, on the cervix and then you're feeling in the abdomen and you want to decide if it's antiverted or retroverted. So if you push up and you feel it then it's probably probably antiverted like shown here. If you push up and you're not feeling anything then it's probably retroverted like this. Reflection uh, refers to the angle of the uterus with respect to the cervix. So if you're going up like this and then this you're antiverted because of the angle between the uterus here and the the vaginal opening and you're also antiflexed because of the angle of the uterus here in the cervix. So you're anti antiverted and antiflexed. So more more along the anatomy review line, we got the aorta bifurcating into the common iliacs, dividing again into the external and the internal. External goes along to become femoral after the inguinal ligament. Internal divides into the posterior and the anterior branch. The anterior is what we're concerned with because that supplies the uterus. That's the uterine artery there, and there's also other important arteries like the vaginal artery and the umbilical artery that come off the anterior branch of the internal iliac artery. Okay, so where's the ure ureter in this picture? The ureter is coming down off the kidney, crossing over the common iliacs right near the bifurcation, and then coming down and passing underneath the uterine artery. So that's the water under the bridge. Lymphatics and embryology, they kind of go together. So we have the uterus and the 
upper part of the vagina. What what do they come from embryo from embryology? They're malarian structures, and so the lymphatics that they drain to are here at the internal and external iliacs, and ultimately up here at the common iliac, uh, the common iliac nodes. And where is this where is this bifurcation of the aorta on, in terms of surface anatomy? It's right here by the by the navel, by the belly button. And what dermatone is that? It's T10, belly butt 10. Okay, and so then we have the distal part of the of the vagina here. Where does that come from embryologically? That comes from the urogenital sinus. Where does it drain to? It goes over here to the femoral. So those are the ing those are the inguinal nodes here by the femoral artery. The ovary, I think we're pretty familiar with this. The ovary comes here, gets blood gets blood from the abdominal aorta directly, and drains to para para aortic nodes. So the final layer of anatomy to add to the ligaments. So we've we've talked about some blood, some of the the arteries and some of the ligaments carry those arteries. So we'll start with those. So we have the infundibulopelvic ligament carrying the uterine artery. And before third year rotation, that was I learned that as a suspensory ligament of the ovary. But now on the rotation, it's called the IP infundibulopelvic ligament carrying the ovarian blood supply. And then we down here we have the uterine artery. What ligament does that run in? That runs in the cardinal ligament. And we have the, the uterosacral ligament connecting the uterus. I'm going posteriorly back to the sacrum, so that comes up here. And the uterosacral and the cardinal um, combine together to form uterosacral complex, which comes over here to the wall of the uterus. We also have the round ligament. That's a red remnant of the gubernaculum. It's headed, it's on, headed on its way to the labia majorum. And then connecting the uterus to the ovary, we have the utero ovarian. So those are the important ligaments here to look at. And now we're moving along nicely here, getting ready to do the operation. So we do the antibiotics, get those in about a, a half an hour before it starts or so. Use cephalosporin, no G-tube, Foley, and generally anesthesia. So we use the Foley to decompress the, bl the bladder, make it, make it thicker, not all distended and thin, which reduces the chance of injury to it. The OG tube helps prevent um, the air from getting into the GI tract, which also helps prevent um, in injury to the GI tract, which is especially important in laparoscopic procedures. And then we have the DVT prophylaxis, heparin, PCD boots, dorsal lithotomy position, and some new new things, specific things to, or more specific things to doing this procedure laparoscopically is a uterine manipulator, which is just a tool like, looks like this, kind of like, I don't know, maybe like a sword, and then it goes into the uterus there. And that's to move, move the uterus around because you're doing it laparoscopically. You can't put in big clamps like culture clamps to to manipulate the uterus to get to get where you need to go, and so then you create the pneumoperitoneum and place your ports, and that's also um, new if you haven't seen laparoscopic procedures before. So a brief overview of how to do this. It's explained more fully in the abdominal access um, lecture, but here we got the aorta coming down, dividing at the navel at T10, branching into our internal and external divisions, and then we have the um, inferior epigastrics br branching off of the external. Um, the external iliac, and the, and that and those are traveling up. Okay, so that's that's our that's our setup there. And so we want to enter the peritoneum. There's two ways to do it: open or closed. Open is you cut down through the layers of the abdominal wall, visualizing what you're doing. Put your ports in, create the pneumoperitoneum. You put the CO2 in and inflate the abdomen. Closed is where you use the needle, the varice needle. So to do that, you incise the skin, and where this is usually done for the initial port is right underneath the belly button. So you incise the skin, and then you get to the to the fascia. You pull up on the abdominal wall a little bit and then you and then you pop the needle in. So you're going to hear two pops in one click. The first pop is going through the abdominal fascia. So up here that would be the, the linea alba. We're above the arcuate line so there's an anterior and a posterior rectus sheath which come together in the middle forming the linea alba. So the first pop is going through the that abdominal fascia. The second pop is going through the peritoneum and then the click is the safety stylet popping out of the needle. So Remember, the, the needle's like this, it has this beveled edge, and when it feels that there's no resistance, once you get through, then the safety stylet pops out, and, that, and that's dull, uh, so that you don't damage what's underneath it, because look where, you're, look where you're pushing it. It's right here where the aorta bifurcates, and there's um, big arteries, there's intestines, and all sorts of stuff that you don't want to hit there, so that pops out to protect you, and also you, you do this at a for, about a 45 degree angle, which helps pr uh, prevent injury too. So you insufflate, you put the CO2, and they have to put the additional ports in. So to put, to put those in, you, now that you've You've um, 
you've got your initial access with the needle, you can test to make sure you're in, that you're actually in, in by doing the water drop test. So you put a little bit of water in, and if the water goes through without a lot of resistance, that, mean, that, means, you've, that means you've made it inside, so you're inside of the peritoneum. If it doesn't, then that means you're not also, if you try to insufflate and you get a really big pressure rise, then you're probably really big pressure rise right off the bat, then you're probably not in yet. So you're in, you put the you put the port in, you put your camera in, now you can look now you can look and see what you're doing for the next two. And so the big thing here is to avoid hitting the inferior epigastrics. And remember those inferior epigastrics come come off here off the external iliac artery. So you're looking, you find to, to get your to get your landmarks, you find the medial ligament. And from embryology, what's medial ligament? That's remnant of the of the um, umbilical arteries. So you see that, then lateral to that you should see the inferior epigastrics and then you put your ports in lateral so you make sure you make sure that you're not hitting them you're, you're, you're watching while you do it so you put in a, a port usually there and there usually I think we had three going N navel and then two lateral ones or just one lateral one okay and so for the procedure itself you start off by looking around inspecting inspecting everything out, checking everything out. So now you've done that, so you can start start the procedure. You cut the rounds and you make the bladder flap. So making the bladder flap means that you have to cut the the vesico uterine peritoneum and there's this avascular space between the the bladder and, and the uterus so you can dissect through there and push the bladder down, get the bladder out of the way. And then you have to make the upper pedicles. So depending if you're bringing the ovaries with you, if you're taking it out uh, or leaving it, you make pedicles either at the IP or at the um, utero ovarian. So let's say we're going to take the ovaries out. Then we have to go find the IP, make sure that we're not uh, cutting cutting the ureter because the ureter is running underneath this IP up here. So here's the ureter coming down. So how do we make sure we're not hitting it? You you want to look at it and make sure and make sure you can see it. So you want to see it peristalsis. Make sure you don't have it grasped. Then you can make that pedicle there. Let's say we're going to um, leave the ovaries inside, then we can make a little hole in the peritoneum here, and we can cut the utero ovarian and the fallopian tubes. All right, so we've got that done. So now we work our way down. We got the bladder out of the way already, and then what? What are the uh, vascular pedicles down here? What are we going to run into? Well, we're going to run into the cardinal ligament coming in from the side, and that's carrying the uterine artery. What's running beneath it? Just like what's running beneath the IP, but it's coming a lot closer here. And that's the ureter, so we got to be really careful. And then coming posteriorly up to the uterus is uterus sacral. So we need to we need to grab these, um, ligate them, divide them, get them off the uterus, and then we and again be careful not to hit the ureter. And now we've got the upper pedicles and the lower pedicles, and we just have the uterus disconnected from everything except for uh, being attached to the vagina. So then the question of tissue removal comes. You can if you can if you're leaving part of the cervix, you have to remove the tissue through uh, the, the ports that you made. So you could so you could you could cut here, leave part of the cervix. Um sew that together just like you would do with the, the vaginal cuff. And then you morselate out the uterus and that's you you put in a, a special little machine into the port that grabs onto the uterus, puts a little bit of pressure onto it, and slowly cuts it, just kind of like peeling an apple, like a like um, an old-fashioned apple peeler. And you get this these strings of uterus, and your goal is to try to get to try to get it all in, out in one string, but it but it's kind of hard to do, I think. And so, if you're not going to do it that way, though, if you're going to do a total and take out the entire uterus, including the cervix, then you conveniently have uh, a hole here. You just let me just get rid of that. So you conveniently have a hole here because because you just opened up the vagina. So you could actually deliver the uterus through the vagina, and then you can um, create your vaginal cuff there. So either way you do it, there's two ways to get the tissue out, depending on if you're leaving part of the cervix or not. So what's the big risk of leaving part of the cervix, or why people would be leery of doing that? Cancer, right? The, and what's the reasons people don't want to take it out? There's concerns about sexual function or fault prolapse, although. Uh, randomized control trials haven't bared that out. Haven't bared out that there is a difference. So post-op, routine post-op care, so you don't need any, any more antibiotics after the first day. Keep the Foley in for a day, some fluids, DVT prophylaxis, ambulation, first day post-op. Advance the diet from sips of water up to regular 
depending on flatus, bowel sounds, and appetite. So in general, what's, why, why is laparoscopic good? Less infection, less uh, pain, shorter recovery time, less blood loss. Although there is a report of increased urologic injury. So complications, there's two ways to divide it up. One is complications of doing the laparoscop doing the procedure laparoscopically, and then the other is just general complications. So things that arise from laparoscopic procedures. The major complications, most of them or half of them happen during entry. So that's hitting the large vessel um, or causing bowel injury, just like we showed the aorta bifurcates here. There's the navel, you're usually putting this initial port here, so there's a lot of important stuff underneath it. The most common vessel injury is the inferior epigastric. We talked about how to avoid that. You want to make sure that you're looking at the medial ligament and you should see the inferior epigastric lateral to it and make sure you don't hit it when you're putting in secondary ports. So you um, bladder injury, you help reduce that by putting in the Foley, DVTs, we know how to help prevent those. Stomach or bowel injury, that's why the OG tube is real, real important. Some of the unique things about uh, creating the pneumoperitoneum that can cause problems or CO2 embolus, pneumothorax, hernia at the larger sites, so you have to close um, large trocar sites, and then shoulder pain, ir irritation to the diaphragm caused by stretching it out or, or the CO2 pushing against it, uh, referring up to the shoulder, and then nerve injury. So some of the general complications, uh, fever, that's the most common, hemorrhage, bladder, injury to the ureter, bowel injury, vaginal cuff dehiscence, so that's that cuff that we make for in the vagina where we sew it together, it gets opened up a little bit and then bowel can actually um, travel down the cuff and get strangled off from its blood supply and die. So that's sort of a serious unique complication that can come from these procedures and then general surgical complications like MI or, or stroke, renal failure. So questions you can get asked, just like the complications can come in two categories, so can the questions. So you can ask questions about doing a procedure, procedure laparoscopically. So physiology of the pneumoperitoneum, what, hap what happens when you create all this um, big time pressure in the in the abdomen. Well, the afterload increases, afterload from the heart. The preload into the heart decreases. Why do you use CO2? Because it's it won't blow up. It's more soluble, so that decreases the risk of a CO2 embolus. The two pops and the click. So when you're putting in that very needle, what are you listening for? The first pop, abdominal fascia. The second pop, peritoneal fascia. The click, safety stylet coming out. So the advantages to doing this procedure laparoscopically, we've mentioned this twice before, it's faster recovery, less pain, less scarring, less ileus. Do you need to close trocar sites? Yeah, you do have to if they're big. So if they're bigger than seven millimeters, they should be closed. Um, and then you can ask, just in, in general, if you're doing a lapar laparoscopic procedure, you can ask if uh, people use techniques um, to, reduce, to reduce shoulder pain. And you can learn about what those techniques are if you listen to the um, abdominal entry, le entry lecture. So uh, questions about the procedure, there's the what's in question. So what's in the round, Samson? What's in the IP, ovarian? What's in the cardinal uterine? Uh, what are the uterine o and ovarian branches of? The ovarian comes off the abdominal aorta. The uterine is the internal iliac. Does it come off the anterior or the posterior? It comes off the anterior. And what's the cause of delayed injury to the ureter? He heat, electrocautery. So you heat up an area next to the ureter, the heat travels, it, it heats up the ureter itself, it causes inflammation and scarring off, which you notice a couple of days after the procedure ends. And so for questions you could ask the person that you're working with, you could ask about how they decide between a vaginal and laparoscopic approach, like for example the size of the ureter or, or nulliparity or endometriosis, do those things play a role? And you could also see if what they think about if, they, if there's an increased risk of your urologic injury, so damage to the ureters or bladder when you're doing um, this, these laparoscopic procedures. You could see if you think it was just part of, if they think it was just part of the learning curve as people got used to doing this, or if it's a real sort of steady state phenomenon that it's just harder to do and it, inc and it increases the chance of, of urologic injury by doing it this way. All right, so that's the review of laparoscopic hysterectomy.